we will turn uh, to our guests who are on screen. Um, uh, I'm very happy to have with us uh, the administrator for UNDP, Akam Steiner, and Cassie Flynn, the UNDP strategic advisor on climate change and head of the UNDP's Climate Promise Program. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to you before we turn to, to uh, reporters for further questions. Uh, Mr. Steiner, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. Can you hear me? Because I can't. Yes. I, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, very brief introduction, then I'll hand over to Cassie Flynn. We are releasing today the NDC Global Outlook Report for 2021, the State of Climate Ambition. And this report complements um, a number of the reports that uh, the UN family is preparing the run-up to Glasgow, particularly to give the public, but also countries, a means by which to understand one central element of the Paris Agreement. You may recall that these so-called NDCs, nationally determined contributions, are the vehicle that the Paris Agreement designed for ratcheting up ambition every five years. And what um, our report will show you today is an understanding of how countries have held up their commitment to this um, agreement. And the first piece of good news that I think we can report, notwithstanding that in many respects the world is behind in terms of acting on climate change, is that 178 nations have submitted their NDCs. In fact, the numbers are still going up, and as of the cutoff date, which was um, about 10 days ago, 90% of the world's nations actually have committed and upheld their commitment to the Paris Agreement and have submitted these NDCs. That is good news because it is fundamental to the world being able to use the Paris Agreement to ultimately arrive at a point in time where the reality of action has caught up where the, with where the science is telling us to be. The second part is, um, this is also a story about ambition. And often in the global aggregate statistics and averages about emissions and uh, financing, we can lose sight of um, the fact that many countries are acting on very different trajectories. And Cassie will speak to in a moment to you about the fact that some of the most vulnerable and poorest countries are in fact the trailblazers in terms of these NDCs, meaning raising the level of ambition in acting on climate change, on mitigation and adaptation. And with the G20 summit just a couple of days uh, away, it is also interesting to observe that in the G20 context, um, not all countries have first of all submitted NDCs by the cutoff date. In fact, we have just seen uh, Saudi Arabia and China submit and Australia resubmit an NDC so those numbers are not yet reflected in the analysis because they were after the cutoff date, but that's a good signal. Let us see whether they actually have raised their ambition levels. But the G20 clearly accounting for three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of global GDP is a central part of making quantitatively these NDCs really deliver. A final point, UNDP, for the past two years has been strongly committed on trying to support countries in preparing these NDCs as national climate strategies. It is not only a report to the UNFCCC, ultimately action will happen because countries integrate climate responses, investments and actions in the national development strategies, in their national budgets. And as part of the NDC partnership involving 35 organizations, we have in fact supported 120 countries and are very pleased with the fact that we now have that 90% submission of NDCs. But let me end by saying um, a very simple thing, which takes us back perhaps to the Cold War and um, the issue of arms control. You may remember that famous statement um, where essentially, um, you know, a famous president at the time used the notion that um, commitments are good, but that verification is better, or promises are good, but verification is better. I think. The same is really the intention with the publication of this report. We want to support the world in being able to not only look at where we are right now, but also what countries are committing to. So ambition is good, implementation is better, and this is a way in which citizens and all countries can look at what countries have now committed to in that next NDC period. Farhan, thank you, and with that, um, back to you or to Cassie. If if not, uh, if not, I will. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you can you hear? Oh yeah yeah now I can hear you. Hi, you're on. 
Uh, Great. Please, please feel Hi, free to go you. ahead. Thank, thank you so much. And this is really just to build on what Administrator Steiner was, was saying. And what we've tried to do as a part of UNDP's climate promise is to really be able to, to look under the hood of these NDCs. Because we throw around a lot of terms like, like ambition, but something that we have learned as a part of the climate promise is that ambition is a very nuanced and context specific undertaking. That how ambitious a country can be also relates, as the administrator was saying, to then how implementable some of these NDCs are. And so you'll see in, in the report today, we have a number of sort of big trends that we have been able to identify as a part of the climate promise. We've done a deep dive analysis of, across NDCs that have been submitted um, to get a sense for the directions that, that countries are moving in. And one of the big, uh, the big headlines out of this is that LDCs and SIDS are leading the way when it comes to ambition. Um, most LDCs and SIDS, 86%, will be increasing their mitigation ambition, and nearly every single LDCs and SIDS will be increasing their adaptation ambition. So we have really seen the countries that are experiencing these impacts on climate change really take this bold step forward, although they are least responsible for, for the challenge. Another trend uh, that we are seeing among these NDCs is that these second generation NDCs are often of higher quality. They are more robust, they have better data, they have better ownership across different parts of society. But this key issue remains is finance. How financeable these NDCs are really relates to how feasible they are and being able to turn a lot of these pledges into action on the ground. And, and this is something that is so important. And as we're looking toward, toward Glasgow and COP26, this issue of finance and this issue of NDCs being an investment strategy that countries can begin to drive investment toward will really come, come to bear. Another trend that we have seen is on inclusivity. In many countries, not all, but in many countries, we see when we have more inclusivity, we often have more ambition. And within the climate promise, we have a, a large number of countries, 93% that have consulted the private sector. We have 64% that are consulting women's groups. We have 58% that are consulting young people um, and really starting to bring these various communities into this process. And we have seen on the whole that when you have more voices around the table, you have more uh, actors around the table, that you do tend to see increases in levels of ambition. And then just one more trend to, to share with everyone is that many NDCs are, are linking across government. One of the things that we know an NDC must do in order to be successful is to really be embedded across all of government and all of society. It can't be within its own silo. And we're seeing many NDCs begin to do this, to link to sustainable development, to also link to green recovery. We've seen about half link to green recovery. And within that, some of these sectoral choices that countries are making, the top choice is renewable energy. Then we have agriculture. Uh, we have uh, nature-based solutions. We have a number of these policy choices where countries are starting to double down um, as their sort of actions begin to be undertaking to fulfill these pledges. So we hope that this is a, a, a helpful a analysis and a snapshot on sort of where the world is, where we think uh, things will go, and that this can inform and better detail some of these very critical negotiations that are about to happen in Glasgow. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, now I'll turn the floor over for anyone who has a question for Mr. Steiner or Ms. Flynn. Uh, first up is, uh, is Evelyn Leopold. Evelyn, are you there? So I am. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Thank you, Brian. Uh, to either Mr. Steiner or Ms. Flynn, um, you mentioned China's plans. China is very important in climate change as well as many other issues in the world. But it seems to be 
leaning toward expanding its coal plants. Could you comment on that? I see. Over to you since you've reviewed some of it already. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. This is this is a critical this is a critical question. And right now we are undertaking an analysis of the submission that China has most recently made uh, just within the last few hours and trying to get a deeper understanding of uh, some of the moves uh, that China can make. And of course, we reinforce what the secretary general has has said in terms of uh, being able to call on all G20 leaders to be as ambitious as possible, and that we know that we cannot uh, fight the climate fight without China doing everything possible. Kristen Salumi. Hi there, Kristen Salumi from Al Jazeera. I apologize if I missed this, but can you sum up where we are with the G20 in terms of NDCs and have, how many have yet to submit them uh, and, and how you would characterize the response there. Thanks. Well, um, as of um, a couple of days ago, we um, saw that 16 countries had submitted NDCs. Um, we now have two more and there may be possibly more coming. Um, it is for the countries to explain why the, the deadline of the 12th of October was not met. But what matters is that um, G20 countries step up. So as of today, Cassie, if I um, have not got the figures wrong, um, 18 have now submitted their NDCs and uh, two are still outstanding. Those two are U.S. Exactly. and... Cassie, go ahead. Okay. I um, we are still thinking, of course, on Turkey to submit NDC, um, and then, of course, we are still. Uh, I believe Australia is still waiting on their official their official submission. Okay, Th thanks, uh, James. Uh, and, oh, sorry. Oh, oh no! Please continue. Oh, I, and I was just going to say we're we're also still waiting um, on India. Thanks. Uh, a question from James Rhino. Oh, hi there. Is the audio working now? Yes, yes, we can hear you just fine. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, sure, I can hear you now. Thanks so much. Um, I mean, Cathy, already a, a second ago, you answered the China latest NDC update question. You said you're looking through it. But what can you tell us from what you've seen so far? Uh, is there much promising in China's new proposals? Or do you, like many of the campaigners and analysts, think that uh, it is mostly a repetition of previous claims and that it doesn't feel so great going into COP26? Right. Right now, as we're looking at this analysis um, of China, we're, we're trying to get a better understanding. And, and as I mentioned, you know, ambition is very context specific, is very, very nuanced. And certainly we're trying to go through the uh, deep dive of all of the numbers that, that China has put forward. So far, we have seen it reinforce what we have heard them say, both um, as a part of the uh, of the the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, um, and then as well as uh, the conversations within the G20. And so um, we are uh, knowing that the stakes are very high, and we do expect hopefully to hear more from them on, on the road to COP26. Thanks. And uh, and James, if I, if I may add, uh, I think you were also asking uh, about our, our, our own stance uh, on on the NDC from China. And, and uh, we're studying it, but we understand it's in line with what China has previously indicated. But what I'd like to add is that, as the Secretary General has noted repeatedly, all countries with the G20 in the lead will need to continuously update their NDCs, not every five years, but every year, until we're on track for 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over for any more questions, if there are any. Uh, okay, there's nothing else online. Uh, if there's nothing else in the room, then I would like to uh, once more thank our, our guests, Akam Steiner and Cassie Flynn. Th thanks very much, and uh, let, let's hope for, for good luck in the, in the days ahead. Uh, th thanks very much.
Thank you, Farhan. Thank you. And, and with that, now I will turn the floor over to Monica Villalagreli. Monica.